Hello John. Hello Oliver. Now today we're going to be talking to Mary Caldwell. Mary is trying to save the, the curlew in Ireland. She's an author of two books I think and she's actually done a 500 mile walk. I think it's across Ireland and the UK. So Mary's on the line today so do you want to say hello to Mary? Uh, good morning Mary. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm very yes. pleased to be uh, talking to you uh, on, on a Sunday morning. Uh, yes. Mary, um, you, you're living in Cornwall. No, I live in Bristol. Oh, beg your pardon. I thought it was Cornwall, sorry. Oh. Yeah, oh, Bristol. That, that's uh, my, my, my colleague Oliver mentioned Cornwall, so uh, he, he, he doesn't know the country that well. <laughs> so he gets his notes wrong. <laughs> it, it's, it's Bristol uh, in, in Wales. Uh, I, I one time was in Cardiff, and of course, uh, I passed through Bristol on my way to Southampton, but that's another story. Mary, uh, we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the uh, forests in this country. And also, before I get on to that, I believe you're a practicing Catholic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, likewise, I am also. Uh, would you be of an age, Mary, when uh, the Holy Mass was celebrated in the, uh, the Latin and the traditional form? Or no, no, I just missed that, I'm afraid. Did you? Uh, well, uh, I was an art boy during that period and I'm still very fond of the old rite uh, from the point of view of uh, <coughs> the fact that the churches at that time were packed. If you weren't in on time <coughs> before Mass started or left it as it just before it started, you might have to stand. Yeah. Now, yeah. You, you might have had that experience, uh, yeah. Mary. Time to change, John. Pardon? Times have changed. Times have changed, yes. Uh, we move on and, and upwards and uh, out. Now, Mary, uh, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the um, the Bruce, uh, the Bruce um, uh, forests that have been uh, ignominiously planted uh, in Ireland and in parts of Britain also, I'm afraid. So, uh, what's your opinion about the, the Bruce forest, Mary? Yeah, the Sitka Spruce Forest. Sitka Spruce is, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, is a, is, a, is a tree from Northern Europe which grows very well in wet conditions, wet and sort of fairly poor soil. And so um, it, it does very well across a lot of Ireland and Britain, in the, particularly the wet, boggy, sort of more upland areas. <clears throat> And it's a very good tree uh, to grow as a cash crop. Um, it, it grows quickly and you can get lots of timber from it, softwood timber very quickly. The problem with it is that um, it is just a crop. So it will grow quickly and um, you can make quite a lot of money uh, within, I mean for a tree, about 50 years or so. Um, but what it does is it takes away those habitats, those wet, marginal, grassy habitats, which do uh, support so much biodiversity. So, for example, the curlew and the hen harrier in Southern Ireland, those are their last remaining nesting sites. And if you put Sitka spruce plantations across their um, habitats where they need to breed, they will go extinct. And it is thought that both the hen harrier and the curlew will be extinct in Ireland in less than 10 years. So although it might seem attractive to some people to plant lots of trees, we're being told at the moment that we have to plant a lot of trees to absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, so the problem or to reduce the sort of amount of greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, I don't think this is necessarily the best way to do it. We're, what we need to be doing is planting trees which are slow growing and will remain in place for a long time. The native hardwoods that grew across Ireland um, and we don't need to be growing fast growing, quickly chopped down Sitka spruce which absorbs carbon for a while while it's growing and then as soon as you cut it down and you burn it and you turn it into things and you disturb the soil, all that carbon is re-released back into the atmosphere again. So it looks like a quick fix, but it isn't. 
It's like everything else, Mary. Uh, uh, something done in haste, repent, re repent at leisure. Uh, yeah. In other, in other yeah. words, these um, um, uh, these point trees. I call them point trees because that's what they look like, and yeah. uh, they're not exactly a very nice sight on the horizon. Uh, perhaps if you're up a, a mountain. Uh, which might otherwise be bare, as some mountains on the continent, for example, in, Sp in Spain, are bare. There's nothing seems to be able to grow on them. Uh, but in Ireland, uh, we, we, we have a, a lovely, and same in Britain, a temperate climate in which trees, native trees, can grow that provide, um, that provide a lot of um, um, habitats for, for our um, uh, wildlife, like curlews and and corn creeks and uh, all the sort of uh, sounds that I heard and the cuckoo of course the, the sounds that I heard in my youth and they were quite common uh, now you don't hear them at all as a matter of fact in Ireland I'd say the cuckoo is nearly extinct because I only heard one once in a place called Lake uh, Guevara uh, near uh, in, in between Mead and Westmead and uh, I heard it there but I've never heard it nearly anywhere else in Ireland, whereas in France uh, I hear it all the time in, in spring. And yeah, so, uh, so the cuckoo would love to have um, sort of scrubby areas to nest in. It loves bushes and scrubby areas, and, um, and it would do very well if, if some of these more bare mountains uh, and grasslands were left to go back to scrub, and the cuckoo would do better there. Birds like um, curlew like more open habitat away from trees. So we have to think very carefully about where we put or where we allow trees to grow or where we plant them. So that we leave space for birds that like trees and we leave space for birds that like more open ground. So it's a choice really. We have lots of choices to make. Um, the corn crake needs um, more open ground. It won't nest in forests, but it likes farmland, we know. My mum was from Inniskillen, and she, she talked all the time about the sound of the corn crake everywhere. Very few people, as you say, have heard one now, and it migrates back to Africa for the winter. So we need to give it a home in the spring where it comes to breathe, and that's in more open farmland where the grass isn't cut too often. It's the cutting for silage um, which has been a big, big issue for birds like curlew and corncrake. Correct. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on the question of, of um, slurry that are uh, 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 spread now on land, and, which, and oftentimes there's a terrible obnoxious smell from the slurry that spread, spread, whereas years ago it was manure, which was actually good for the soil and good for... Um, uh, the growing of vegetables, which a lot of people did in this country in Ireland and I suppose in Britain as well, uh, before the advent of the uh, supermarkets and the, multi the multiples whose needs uh, didn't include that type of uh, growth that we enjoyed when I was young and perhaps when you were young. Uh, so um, I, I'm just thinking when you mentioned about trees, uh, what about the uh, beech tree? Uh, which has great uses also uh, for uh, the making of furniture, For it also had a lot of health properties years ago. Um, it has lovely big leaves uh, which are marvellous um, marvelous to make salads in spring. And of course it's a great uh, place for nature and has many uses. So there's a tree that has great uses and not alone that but the oak tree. Absolutely. So these native trees to Ireland and um, Britain, um, the oak, the ash, the beech, are wonderful trees which, um, which we should allow to come back in large areas. And they will provide habitat for birds. They'll provide us with good wood, as you say, with lots of very good properties. Um, and, uh, and they will store the carbon because we don't cut them down all the time really quickly, which is what we do with the Sitka spruce. And you mentioned earlier that the Sitka spruce doesn't look great. You're right, John, it doesn't. And it produces like a green wall of trees with no light that comes through it. It's impenetrable, it's dense, nothing grows underneath, there's no areas 
that are open to allow flowers to grow. There's very, very dense blocks of trees, which are very... Hello? Mary? ...for animals and trees to live in. Yeah, now, uh, what it also does is blight the landscape from the point of view. Uh, if you ever walk uh, in, in near where I live, uh, there's a park called Deer Park, uh, which is in uh, near Virginia and County Cavan. And uh, there's a uh, Kiltje, this is the uh, crowd in Ireland that operate the forestry service on behalf of the government. Kiltje, is it? Kiltje, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a, the Irish Forestry Service. It's a semi-state body that operates the forest. And there's one called Deer Park in, um, in Virginia and County Cabin and uh, I've often had many a walk there. Now, the trouble with it is there are parts in it because um, uh, they've been provided, but uh, the trees themselves have a kind of a negative quality about them. Uh, I often compare them to a desert in which the, uh, the soil is, is uh, not fit to take any kind of vegetation. Uh, they have that effect on the spirit, whereas if you walk in a, a near a lake or um, in, in certain parts of the country where there are, are only native trees, it's a very spiritual type of experience because I love to see when I'm in the country, I don't know if you have the same idea Mary, uh, to see uh, cow, the, the cattle in the fields grazing and sheep grazing <coughs> and, and chewing the cud and uh, it's a very pastoral pleasant sort of a scene especially <coughs> if there are the native trees about the place and especially the buddleia, which attracts butterflies. So there can be a grand, lovely, peaceful uh, sound. Listen to the birds also singing, especially in spring, singing their songs, singing their lovely tunes. Do you, do you yes. find that, Mary? Yes, I do. I think that's, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, the, the hardwood forest, the beech and oak forest, the beautiful, calm places, in fact, the Japanese have a lovely uh, word for it, you know, John, called Shinrin-yoku. That's what they call it, Shinrin-yoku. And that means walking through a forest and literally bathing in the air of the wood. It's a beautiful way to think about trees. That, um, they, they have this lovely smell and ambiance and they, they are so uplifting. It's like having a warm bath in the forest. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? It is, and uh, especially if one is fortunate to have <coughs> either a man-made lake or, um, or, 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 a, or a genuine lake nearby and uh, where one can see swans and ducks and other various uh, wildlife that use the waters in our country and perhaps uh, then fish uh, that, that live in the lakes, uh, trout and, and other varieties. Uh, and, and it's a it's a lovely pleasant uh, way to pass an, e uh, an evening in, in spring or summer and I'm just think, I'm thinking also Mary uh, about flowers uh, that one might have in one's garden in in spring uh, we, we we planted years ago myself and my late wife sort of mercenary uh, we planted um, uh, these wild flowers these wild uh, daisies that grow uh, and uh, they're a lovely sight when they're in bloom and we've had some uh, had some in the garden this uh, this year and really it looked like a touch of heaven as one looked out. Have, yes, you, have you that experience also? The, uh, flowers, they have flowers really and of course the right flowers if we think about which ones to plant really really good for insects um, and we need the insects don't we John for pollinators to pollinate right. Like that's right to plant, um, produce honey and so we need to think about what flowers we do plant and flowers that attract insects and lots sounds not great good for either. insects and butterflies yes yes Yes, Mary, well, we, 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 we have a variety of flowers and roses and what have you, and are, they're often out for the, for the whole year. One of the ones we planted one time, and I had to really do a major job, was, uh, I think, forget-me-nots, and they seemed to sprout up everywhere. 
Yeah, ah, they're very good, aren't they? So, Pretty thick. So. <laughs> they were even grown in the patio and uh, mm -hmm. you know which is kind of uh, slabs of concrete uh, so I mean as a matter of fact it would seem to grow anywhere uh, and I didn't they weren't planted there of course so uh, these are uh, things that you learn as you go along Mary. now when you live in Bristol um, uh, I understand uh, that you have written a couple of books and also that you walked in, in, in Britain, uh, 500 miles. Yes, so I've written two books. The first one, the, the first book I wrote was on a, a, an environmentalist called John Muir. I don't know if you know who John Muir is, John. He was born in Scotland in the 19th century, in 1838, and then he went over to, to he was brought up in a very, very strict um, Presbyterian, Scottish Presbyterian family, very yeah. fundamental, Christian family, and his father was quite brutal, really. And he took the family over to Wisconsin um, in America, and they became frontier farmers. And John had a very hard life, but he fell in love with nature, and he had a very adventurous life eventually, and he um, ended up founding America's National Parks. And the reason I love him so much was because his writing is full of the joy of nature, how you can find God in nature, and how we have a fundamental responsibility to protect it and to live alongside it. I mean, he was very like St. Francis in many ways, in that he saw other creatures as our brothers and sisters. You know, St. Francis talked about brother sun and sister moon and sister birds and brother fish. And that John Muir was very much of that spirit. And um, I wrote a book about him, about his life, and his relationship with the natural world and how he founded national parks, first of all in America, and then the idea was exported around the world. And an amazing writer and a wonderful human being. And then the second book I wrote was about my walk from the west coast of Ireland. So I started off actually in Inniskillen and then down to Sligo. And then I walked through Ireland, through Wales, and then through England, and ended up on the east coast of England to try to find out what was happening to the curlew. And you, as being an Irishman, John, you'll know that the curlew is such an iconic bird of Ireland. You would have remembered hearing it trilling and bubbling over the moors and the bogs and the farmlands when you were growing up, I'm sure. I certainly did. And there were, um, in the 1980s, there were about five to 7,000 pairs of curlew breeding in Ireland. That's a breeding bird. Do you know how many there are now? How many, Mary? Just over 120. That's nearly extinct. It, so you will lose the curlew in Ireland as a breeding bird in about five to ten years' time. How does that make you feel, John? Well, it just, it's, 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 it's absolutely dreadful to think that uh, uh, such a, a, a native bird and such a, a, a pleasant sound of summer uh, to be uh, uh, to be nearly extinct is is a disgrace really to the uh, to the management of of the countryside by those charged with managing it. Uh, you mentioned Mary where you where you walked in Ireland, and I'm very familiar with with Sligo uh, because my father was a, a policeman, but a guard at the column here, stationed in Boy County Roscommon, and don't forget we were near uh, uh, the lovely Loch Key that's reputed to have 32 islands in it, oh, yeah. one for yeah, each country. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah, and um, it, it was, uh, there was a big estate there operated by Sir Cecil King Harmon, and uh, there's a lot of native trees in there now, it's, it's, it's under the, it's now been distributed among farmers, but uh, also Leitrim. I went to, I went to the secondary school in Leitrim, the Presentation Brothers were the, were the people uh, teaching there in my time in the late 50s and they did a marvellous job uh, but Leitrim was a lovely county and one that I'm very fond of. Uh, the fact that you mentioned uh, that, uh, uh, that it's been over planted now with these um, pine trees I call them uh, that are a blight on the landscape. I think um, whoever is responsible for, for this uh, uh, kind of infliction on the local community. It wants to sort of 
revisit uh, what our objective is and perhaps uh, think of the nature and the, uh, the desirability of having uh, these native species that are near, near, near extinct. And exactly, uh, John. I, just, I describe, in my book, I describe walking through Leitrim and Rock Common, and um, I went to Lockery, and um, the islands, a couple of the islands in Lockery are about one of the only few places left where Kurdi breed, and that's because they're on islands, they're protected on islands, and they're not planted up. And one of the biggest issues facing Curlew, there's two, there's three massive issues facing Curlew in Ireland. One is the plantation of trees, Sitka spruce, on their breeding grounds, the remaining breeding grounds. So, so forestry is a major issue in Ireland for, for ground nesting birds like Curlew. The second one is how we farm the land. We drain it, we plant fast-growing ryegrass, we cut it for silage from April, May onwards. And the ground nesting birds like curlew get chopped up in the silage machines. So, um, so that's the second issue. And the third issue is the, the, the way we use the land now, forests and fast growing crops, is very good for promoting predators. There's a lot of foxes and crows in Ireland, and they eat ground nesting birds. So it's not their fault. I mean, we've made the landscape very good for predators. So the three major issues facing ground nesting birds, which is why they can't find, they can't produce enough chicks to sustain the population. So this year, I know that Ireland produced no more than, say, 40 chicks in the whole of Southern Ireland. 40 chicks will not keep curlew breeding in Ireland. Not there are not enough young birds coming back to replace the ones that are dying off. So you will have a curlew-free land in the spring and summer um, by before we get to um, by the end of sort of twenty at the end of the twenty twenty. Uh, that that that's a, that 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 they should try and rectify that. But I'll give you something that's happening that's kind of uh, perhaps a little um, area of hope. Uh, there is uh, grants now on farms, and matter of fact, one that lives beside where I live because I live in the country but near a town but really there's fields and cattle all around and uh, they have uh, about three acres set aside and uh, they have various things in that in that uh, set aside land to promote wildlife uh, bees and um, other uh, and birds and all, the, and all that type of thing and they're not allowed to cut the grass uh, like the, where they normally try to get two cuts uh, for silage and they're not allowed to do that because uh, uh, the butterflies and all the, and other sort of um, wildlife y uses the, the flowers and the pot That's balls. That's right. So, so there are good agri-environment schemes. They're called agri-environment schemes. So farmers will get paid not to cut a lot of silage. They'll get paid That's for right. not doing quite a lot of agricultural uh, activities. Yeah. So to leave some of the land for wildlife. Um, and that helps, that helps. But we, we need a lot more than that. We do, we do. Uh, but, and we are doing it. I mean, there are some really good people doing really good things, but we need to, you know, bolster them up and help them and raise awareness and give them lots of profiles so that everybody's aware of what a serious situation it is in Ireland. I think you will be, Ireland will be the first country where curly will go extinct as a breeding bird. And that's really sad, seeing as it is such an important bird in Irish cultural history. Yes, well, at least, Mary, uh, thanks to you, and now hopefully uh, myself and, uh, and our little uh, website, the Christian and Jobs Action Party, hopefully uh, we will get a little bit more uh, publicity about it. You've done a marvellous job uh, in the books and the fact that you took this walk and it seems to me from from the, being in this country and in, 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 in Britain uh, that you walk more than 500 miles. I did. That was a long way. I think so. But it was a wonderful and I met some fantastic people and what, I, what fills you with hope is that when if you know about curlews you love them. And we mustn't lose that love, because once they've gone, they've gone, and people forget. 
But while we've still got them, we've still got the ability to connect people back to that beautiful wild songster, and they won't want to lose it if they know about it. So, we, you know, we just need to let people understand and reconnect again. That's the word, isn't it? Reconnect. That's right. Reconnect, and uh, you know uh, that that that's a very worthwhile and noble cause to undertake. And you've encountered people that are concerned about these. So one might say, perhaps the majority of people, especially with well, the majority of, of people could be very well persuaded to sort of agitate for this to actually happen. And hopefully, we will use whatever endeavours we have to promote that awareness and uh, and support uh, for something to be done to rectify this uh, draconian situation that's unfolding with the policies that have been pursued. Thank you John, I would appreciate it if you could do that. And did you just, uh, if we can just find out exactly the names of the books, the two books that yeah. you wrote yeah. and where they can be bought. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Mary mentioned John, John New. Uh, John Muir, yeah, John uh, yeah. Muir. The book is called John Muir, The Scotsman Who Saved America's Wild Places. Uh, John Muir, M-U-I-R. And, uh, and the, the book about curlews is called Curlew Moon um, because the shape of the curlew's bill, the nice long downward curving bill, um, reminded people of, um, of the new moon. So it's called Curlew Moon. That's a lovely title. So they're the two books, Mary. And of course, did you did you did you write any article about your 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 marvelous um, undertaking of that long walk in Ireland and Britain, uh, touching perhaps a thousand miles as far as I'm concerned, trying to work it out? Um, uh, did you did you uh, write articles about that experience? Yes, I've written lots of articles about it, um, lots of articles, and, and there was in the newspapers a lot at the time because. When, um, as soon as I finished the walk, I organised the first All-Ireland Curlew Conference, which we held in Higgins Town in November 2016. And, um, and that was really successful. 130 people came to that. And um, everybody wanted to work together to help to save the curlew. And lots of good things came out of that. So um, the Curlew Task Force, the Irish Curlew Task Force, came out of that meeting in 2016. Lovely, uh, because I understand from my colleague Oliver uh, that uh, there are now about 40,000 people uh, inquiring about the curlew uh, regularly on, on the internet. So uh, it shows you that there's quite a substantial amount of interest in it and, and that is very worthwhile because they can bring pressure to bear on local politicians and uh, when we have an election. Uh, in yes. this country, which yes. we, 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 and that's we, very important. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, and Mary, now, um, is that, that's, uh, that's it really. I mean, that was a fantastic uh, interview. Yeah, right? I, I'm just going to say one thing about the, uh, about the, um, we'd say the, the way things have occurred with regard to this afforestation. But there's a matter, there's a, there's a um, an item that um, I sort of. Uh, I think that has more to do with uh, the abuse of the system is the plastic uh, uh, bottles and all the rest of it, which in this country really occurred with the advent of the supermarket multiples, the, the monopoly situation that obtains. And I know you have a monopoly situation in the UK with the predominance of big multinational supermarkets, which I think are actually not a good thing for society because. Uh, they use um, plastic more than anything, uh, whereas years ago when I was young, uh, there was quite the reverse. It was uh, you bought your basket to the shop because we had to do uh, the message for my parents. And uh, you got brown paper bags, everything was packed and everything was, was, uh, could, could be, it wasn't a threat to the environment. But plastic can't degrade and they haven't seemed to be able to invent uh, plastic that can degrade, so this is the one that's causing the problem, in my opinion, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, yeah. yeah. the, 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 uh, the world, because I believe the oceans are, are awash with plastic, and uh, so uh, and people in this country, uh, because we have a, a very peculiar 
uh, government uh, situation that expects you to bring your rubbish home. Uh, so the uh, amount of uh, refuse bins, particularly at the seaside, is, is, is nearly absent, uh, which is unlike other countries in Europe that I have visited um, abroad. And there's, there's uh, bins everywhere and uh, every opportunity to recycle, um, or, or rather to uh, use the bins. So there's very little, there's little or no litter, whereas in Ireland, and there's litter thrown around the country, people throwing things out of cars, and it's really an abomination. Yes, I agree with that, John. I think, I think we've all got to get much, much better at being responsible for what we buy and what we do with the packaging. And we've all got to do that. And there's no excuse for dropping litter anywhere. No. Um, we, we, we either put it away in a proper bin so it can be dealt with, or it is recycled, and none of it should end up on roadside verges, in city streets, That's anywhere. Right. It's a danger to us, it's a danger to wildlife, and it's disgusting. It's, it's, of course it is, but one thing that I think is partly responsible for this state of affairs, Mary, because I noticed in my visits to France and other European countries, which I visit a fair bit in my time, and, and I'm still at it, uh, <coughs> is that they haven't got these massive uh, in this country we have a, a lot of big refuse lorries because it was private, the, the, the system that's operated uh, up to maybe 15-20 years ago was operated by the, uh, the councils but uh, they, they were denied the funds and so it was handed over to private individuals so you can have in a town or a biggest type of town you can have four or five or six different refuse uh, companies all vying for a bit of business here and there and with the result there's often traffic jams and I think it's a very inefficient way to collect rubbish because these lorries must contribute to the smoke and the um, atmosphere etc and I wonder why they can't introduce something like what they have in the continent where they have skips or big larger skips and wheelie bins where citizens nearby can put their rubbish in and so therefore there's no there's no uh, litter in those countries. I yes, wonder I why agree. They... We're not very good at it, are we? We're way behind many parts of Europe. Pardon? I said we're not very good at it, are we? We're way behind other countries in Europe. We, we are and I think it's because of this business of all these big massive lorries. Uh, going around. Uh, where I live, it's a, 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 a narrow road near the town. It's only fit for one vehicle. Uh, but once or twice I had to nearly smartly jump into the ditch <laughs> with one of these lorries taking up the whole road. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I let some sort of um, words that I wouldn't like to repeat to uh, the driver uh, and the, the helpers coming down such a, a, a road and this is the type of thing that happened in, I say in Britain because I think they have the same now maybe the council does it there but the, it's not the best way to be collecting rubbish I think they should take a leave from from France and these other countries Spain that don't have this business of big lorries coming around towns they come at early morning and late at night when I lived in Spain for some years uh, the refuse were collected every night at 11 o'clock in the area that I lived in, and uh, except for Christmas Day. Yeah. Now that's yeah. what I call a system. So it was none of this business of big lorries calling to each individual house, as they do in this country and probably to do in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mary, that's something I think we, we might address ourselves. Uh, Absolutely, there's plenty of things we can do, we just need to, and none of them are that difficult, we just need to do them. Correct, and, and need to agitate for it. What, yeah. fu what future plans are there going forward, does uh, she have, does Mary have? Yes Mary, do you have any future plans going forward? For the curling? Oh yes, the lots, lots, lots of plans for everything. One of the, I'm doing two big things at the moment, one is I'm introducing a qualification, a GCSE, I'm not sure what you call them in Ireland, is it um, the, the, the exam that 16 year olds take? Yes, yes that would be the intercert or leaving cert I think. Aye, it? that's right, yes, uh, that, 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 uh, secondary, the secondary school sort of uh, certificate. Yes, go yes. ahead Mary. Uh, yes, so I'm introducing um, 
one of those exams in natural history so that children in school learn what about nature. They know what a curlew is, what a bluebell is, what an oak tree is. Lovely. They understand what it needs to live. They understand the connection of, of native wildlife to the rest of the world. So a, a qualification in natural history in schools put nature back into the heart of education. So I'm doing that. I'm also continuing to work with Curlew and planning a big meeting of Curlew field workers next year to bring everybody together to discuss the best way to protect them and exchange information and experiences and practical tips and things. Um, and I'm also writing a book on our relationship with predators. Um, you know, foxes, badgers, crows, seals, all, all the lovely animals that we find it very hard to live with. So those are the three big things I'm doing. That's excellent, uh, Mary, because actually <coughs> my father was, as I say, a policeman in the Garda, and uh, there was uh, money to be paid for a uh, fox uh, if a fox was killed because they interfered with farmers that kept, a lot of farmers uh, in this country kept uh, hens and chickens and that, so they had their own eggs. It's not so common now, unfortunately, because with the EU they've got a kind of lazy. Uh, whereas, funny enough, in France, uh, nearly every other person that has any bit of ground at all has, has livestock. So, Mary, I'm delighted to hear uh, that you've uh, this this marvelous um, um, this this mar marvelous uh, vocation uh, to try and redress the, the imbalance now that's in, that's in nature and that's that's not good for curlews and and corn crakes and cuckoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got so much to learn. We've got to get people understanding and knowing and feeling that they know these animals again and know what they need, and then we've got much better chance of making the right decision. Lovely Mary, I hope you have great success, and I'm going to be following your, uh, your uh, what the results, and hopefully, uh, especially in the schools, uh, that you've introduced this natural, um, this natural uh, study yeah. of nature and uh, the wildlife and habitat, etc. Well done Mary, lovely talking to you. Thank you very much, John. A pleasure to talk to you too. Thank you, Mary. God bless. Bye. And you. Bye-bye.